Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our class on Pastor Wolf Mueller's book, Has American Christianity Failed? We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, today we begin uh, one of the most important chapters of the book, chapter 4, found on page 72. And so important because it's really the answer to the previous chapter, chapter 3, How Bad a Boy Are You? Um, we found out worse than we ever thought, and, and even then, still worse. Um, that's really a, a very accurate way of putting our sinful condition. We, as God's creatures, are good creatures, and yet we have been so corrupted by sin that nothing remains uncorrupted. So much so that the scriptures say we are dead in our trespasses. And then it's going to be, since, since the dead can't raise themselves, it's going to be up to Christ to raise us from the dead. Up to our Father to make us alive just as he raised Christ from the dead, so then also to raise us first, spiritually, the spiritual resurrection, which is conversion, that's coming to faith in Christ, followed by the bodily resurrection, which everyone here in this room is eagerly waiting for. We're waiting for our bodies to catch up with our souls. And we're also waiting for baptism to have its full work on our souls. Not only has it given us newness of life even now, but we're waiting for, we're waiting for baptism to then finish putting to death the flesh that is within us along with the body. And then final fulfillment of baptism to rise in bodies made new and perfect. Um, they're, they're material bodies, they're these bodies, but they're so much higher and different, the scriptures call them spiritual bodies. Jesus, raised from the dead, has a spiritual body. Still bears the wounds, it's still his body that was crucified, born of Mary, it remains his body forever. Our bodies will remain our bodies forever. And yet he, even his body is transformed and um, into a spiritual body. Such that, such that, for example, even his dear disciples and closest followers have a hard time recognizing him. There's a great, there's a great um, well, of course, this comes from Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. But remember how when Gandalf uh, perishes in the fight with the Balrog, right, they both, they're both locked in mortal combat. They both go down. They both die. And yet one rises and the other doesn't. The ball rug is crushed forever. A ball rug, by the way, if you're not a dork like I am and a nerd and all into this stuff, a ball rug is this fiery, demonic kind of beast. Uh, it's a great, great kind of like Tolkien's way, artistic way of saying, you know, uh, it's clearly not the devil, but I want you to think about the devil. <laughs> Gandalf is clearly not Jesus, but I want you to think about Jesus. That's Tolkien's way. And so, Gandalf rises, and before his death, he was Gandalf the Grey. And he was known and recognized by his gray robe, and in the book, less than the, than the, or more than the movie, I mean, kind of hunched over. That's kind of the irony of, of Gandalf, is you'd look at him and he kind of looked like a tired old man, a weary traveler. But then when he needed to, he, he, he could raise himself up and pull his shoulders back and tower in height and intimidation and have, have this great power. So this, this contrast of humility and power, but clothed in, the, clothed in the gray. When he returns, when he's raised, he's raised as Gandalf the White. And that kind of majesty then is with his person um, then for the remainder of the story. And, and so in that, that little interesting transition, we can, we can glimpse. Again, Tolkien isn't saying this is Jesus, this is how it is. But Tolkien's saying, think about Jesus. When you read this, think about Jesus. And so as we think about Jesus, according to the scriptures, we see that after he's raised, he's raised in a body glorified. 
and so we shall be raised in bodies glorified as well. Okay, so we're waiting, we're waiting for Christ who has already begun this good work in us to bring it to completion. He has already found we who are dead in our trespasses and sins and he's made us alive and that, that new creation that he's making within us is a continued work until the end of the age where we are raised in our bodies as I just said and then and then begins that age which is to come so this chapter very important as I said because it's an answer uh, it's our Lord Jesus answer to what is preceded this chapter page 72 is called the one who is always and only for you and the for you is in quotes because as we'll see this comes out of scripture Wolf Mueller here quotes Revelation 1.17, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Such a wonderful and profound statement because we can ponder all the ways in which he's the first and the last. And there's a multitude of ways in which that, that, that is true. And as we think of them, the multidimensionality of our Savior Jesus, his perfect control, his perfect mercy, his perfect love, his perfect goodness, then of course we can see why it is that St. John says, fear not. Fear not. He's got everything well in hand. All right, first paragraph, Wolf Miller writes, people who are sick or who think they are sick are always checking their pulse, taking their temperature, Measuring their own health. You know, prior to COVID, we all got colds a lot more often. <laughs> and one of my favorite things was to have a man cold. You know, you get a cold, you know you could carry on a little bit, but you don't want to. So you lay down on the couch as if you're dying. This is a man cold. Yeah. It's one of the few privileges of being a man. You have a man cold. You just, you can't handle it. So you lay down on the couch and... Um, yeah, so I can resonate with this. People who are sick or who think they are sick, they're always checking their pulse, taking their temperature, measuring their own health, or laying on the couch saying, I think I'm gonna die, I can't do anything. Hypochondria, Acute temporary hypochondria, yeah. <laughs> A sick Theology, Wolf Mueller writes, a sick theology does the same. So you just brought up that word hypochondria. Maybe that's a good way of thinking this. A sick theology creates a kind of hypochondria. We, um, in, in some, now I don't think it's identical in American Christianity, but the, ancient, the church fathers, the ancient theologians, spoke often of, um, you know, scrupulosity and this kind of being too inwardly focused. How, how am I doing? You know, how, how did I rate today? How did I, even more acute, how did I do this past hour? How did I do this last minute? There's this, there's this tendency to overanalyze everything. Every conversation, coulda, woulda, shoulda. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? Was I too mean? Was I not mean enough? <laughs> you know, and, and so we can, we can recognize this, that, that while there may be good aspects of that, it can get pushed into a very unhealthy extreme. And in, in some ways, what I've just described resonates with American Christianity. In some ways, it doesn't. But I just wanted to kind of broaden out our little semantic domain as we're considering Wolf Mueller's point, which maybe is a little more focused. All right, so a sick theology does the same. Christians who are constantly measuring and testing their spiritual state are Christians with an unhealthy theology. And that's, I think that that's very true. I mean, we can be interested, as the New Testament is, in growing. But growing is different than measuring constantly, isn't it? My kids are growing just fine whether I measure them or not. <laughs> and so too with a healthy spirituality. You can grow just fine without constantly measuring. And then the constant testing, you know. And we're going to see with this constant measuring and testing, maybe particularly the testing of oneself. 
know, that, that over and uh, analyzing and that, where's our attention? Us. Us. And there's really the disease. It's very subtle disease. Christianity becomes more about the Christian than about Christ. Our eyes become so internally focused, we forget to look outside. And this is, this is one of the devil's greatest tricks, to take a religion that's all about Christ and make it all about me. And of course, my flesh being self-centered, the incurvatus in say, the, the self turned in on itself, my flesh is happy to oblige and loves a spirituality that's all about me. And so, so a healthy rebalancing of that is a Christianity that's all about Christ, what Christ does for me, and I'm not going to fall into the opposite error and deny that it has anything to do with me or deny that there's any growth or progress. Of course, there's all these things, but my attention is going to be on Christ. You can think of the, the vine and the branch. Remember that? And how does the, how does the branch, that's us, bear fruit? By itself? If the branch is separated from the vine, can it bear fruit? No, no it's dead. It's not going to bear any fruit. Only if it's connected to the vine will it bear fruit. So what should the branch be interested in? Bearing fruit or staying in the, in the vine? <laughs> staying in the vine and you will bear fruit, right? You see how that works? It's almost as if Jesus understood all of this perfectly. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. So the, so the branches abide in the vine with our hearts and minds set on Jesus, the, with, with the branches abiding in the vine, then they will bear much fruit. You see how that works? It's not that we're unconcerned about fruit, it's just that our attention is on the vine and therefore we bear fruit. All right. So once more from Wolfmuller, Christians who are constantly measuring and testing their spiritual state are Christians with an unhealthy theology. The focus is in the wrong place on themselves, their works, their thoughts, their obedience, their nearness or distance from God. This sadly is the condition of American Christianity. Dropping down, just um, skipping a paragraph there. A strong faith is a faith that rests in Jesus. A healthy theology is a theology that is laser focused on Jesus. Interesting where we see Jesus taken out of the churches. What would that say then? Profoundly unhealthy. Right? Profoundly unhealthy. And I think what often goes is it's like, well, we're just gonna we're gonna minimize Jesus. This is about you and God, but God apart from Jesus really isn't God. <laughs> <laughs> and actually has no staying power. And so where it, where it becomes, it start, what starts maybe as a Christian church slowly loses Christ, becomes about God, and then slowly loses God and becomes about you. Or what I've seen frequently, not just you as an individual, but maybe even more like the church as a corporate body. So us. I've been to, um, I've been to some big box uh, evangelical churches where almost... Um, Almost the entirety of the message, the pastor's 45-minute long talk, and then all the advertisements, or I, maybe they call them announcements, I don't know, um, are advertising what the church has done. And, and so it's all like, this is who we are, this is what we're done, this is our missionary outreach, these are the th ways we're reaching out into the community, this is all the... Well, okay, not a word was said about who? Christ. Christ. It's all about us and what we're doing and how successful we are and... The entire focus is on us corporately or you individually. And so you can see how this, this spirituality just it, it has this kind of this force where it, the, the circle just keeps getting bigger and bigger until you're so far away from Christ that you've almost ceased to be a Christian church. <laughs> All right, a little more from Wolfmuller. Here he's got um, a quotation from Hebrews 12. The scriptures fix our eyes not on ourselves, but on Christ. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Beautiful. So, looking to Jesus. Again, the motif here, we run our race. Who's going to run a, run a race with a bunch of, uh, you know, would you put a backpack with some, some weights on you and then go compete in a race? No. That's what it's like carrying around our sins and the guilt of our sins. We need to set those aside. Christ has paid for them. We need to leave our baggage behind us and then run the race, and then is it a sprint? Nope. <laughs> it's a marathon. That's why it's endurance we need. And, you know, one of the, one of the most disconcerting things that I see so sometimes in uh, new Christians or Christians who have just come back to the faith is they're so excited. That's not, that's not disconcerting. But their excitement is as if what's, now it's just a sprint. It's a quick sprint to the end. And sometimes as a pastor you have to be like, okay, Slow down, slow down. This is a marathon. I'm, I'm so glad you're running. Take it easy, pace yourself. Don't try to do too much, too fast, um, because we do need endurance. It's this beautiful motif, and we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, you know, angels, archangels, and the whole company of heaven joining with us in the divine service, um, as, our, as our liturgy says. And as this scripture indicates, and we're running a race, we're laying aside every weight which clings to us, our sins, our cares of this world, we're laying them aside so that we can run and run with endurance with our eyes set on Jesus, who, by the way, is leading the way in this analogy, and indeed has already crossed the finish line and is there. And with our eyes set on him, we too will finish the race. We too will cross that finish line, which is such a beautiful thing because there's an end. Sometimes that's like the greatest gospel that hits me, is, hey, hey, it's all temporary. This is all going to end. You're not going to struggle with these things forever. Not your own sins, not the sins of others, not the fallen world. Hey, it's all, it's all temporary. So run, endure. There, there is a beginning of these things and an end of these things. Isn't that blessed? And at the end of these things, guess who's there? Jesus and endless healing and endless rest and endless compassion and endless joy. So take heart, take your time, it's all right. Just a beautiful line of scripture here, a beautiful uh, section of scripture. Much needed in our current context. Skipping over to page 73. Oh yeah, please, are we, uh, let's get a microphone up here, please. Thank you so much. Wouldn't it also be important to emphasize that he's in the beginning and the end and all during Absolutely. The, the, yeah. the, the middle? So, yeah, thank yeah. you for bringing that out. And that's a point maybe I should have made more explicit. I, I think that that's even why perhaps uh, Wolf Mueller chose Revelation 117. I am the first and the last. Yeah, so fair enough to flesh, to flesh out the wholeness of this. Christ is at the beginning and at the end. <laughs> and he's running right along with us, our, our Savior who's present tense with us in word and sacrament. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So jumping over to page 73, um, the great big font. Much of American Christianity is focused on the Christian and not on Christ. By the way, I think that this also has an effect on why, it, why church becomes so casual. I'm not saying church needs to be like stuffy or overly formal, so don't get me wrong. But what we've really seen is kind of unique in that church has gotten so casual. In some respects, it's kind of tracked right along with culture, hasn't it? I mean, you know, at a courtroom, I had jury duty and it was pretty casual. Uh, you, go, you go on an airplane, it's pretty casual. People pretty much just wear their pajamas these days. Um, so it's a bigger cultural issue to be sure. 
But in the church where people ostensibly know they're coming into the presence of God, you would think that there's, you know, kind of a culturally appropriate response to that in how and what one wears, how one dresses. But in American Christianity, where the focus has gone away from Christ and God is sort of everywhere and nowhere, the same way he's everywhere and nowhere in all of life, and in all of life I'm casual, then why should I dress up to come here? And so you don't. It doesn't make sense. Um, but where you have Christ as the focus and your understanding is that of the ancient and historic church and that of the apostolic scriptures, that it is truly Christ who was crucified, Christ who was raised from the dead, who comes present in a unique and special way. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. See, this isn't the general presence of Christ or the general presence of God. It's a unique and specific presence where two or three are gathered together, there I am. And if we tie that in with another idea that Jesus taught, I came not to be served, but to serve, then we see, we see why, why Lutherans call it divine service. The divine one is present to serve us. Present tense in his word and in his sacrament, okay? Um, and so then knowing that Jesus is there, that changes our attire, it changes our churches, it, it makes us want to be reverent. Again, not formal in an overly stuffy or dramatic way, um, but just up our game a little because we recognize who's there and what's actually going on with our hearts and minds set on the present Christ and what he's doing. Um, that's, where, that's where our reverence comes from. Right? Where that theology goes away, guess what happens to reverence? Whoosh, gone. And that's why church in America is so irreverent, irreverent. Um, so where Christ is the center, then a, a kind of natural, not unnatural, not forced, but a kind of natural, organic reverence emerges. So I think we can kind of look at, look at how ch whether churches, the structure is, uh, the architecture is reverent or not, the furniture reverent or not, um, the people dressed and behaving reverently or not. It's a kind of symptom. It's not always accurate, but it can tend to be a kind of symptom for whether or not people understand if Christ is there and whether or not their hearts and their minds are, are set on Christ, present tense, there for them in the divine service on Sunday morning. Yes, please. So um, <clears throat> we had like an associate pastor. He was a lawyer, and um, he used to give really good second hour Sunday school stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, one time he talked on why we do what we do, the service. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the topics was how the attire is. And he gave the analogy that he being a lawyer, he doesn't come walking down to come before the judge dressed in um, like bell, bell bottoms and things. He puts on a nice suit and he addresses the judge mm -hmm. with the proper respect mm -hmm. do that office. Mm -hmm. So when we come before God, and yes, we're coming to Jesus, but we're coming to God, the triune God. Right. Jesus will also be our judge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was just showing the proper respect. That's, yeah, how, he, that's right. how he put it. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that reflection. It's, it's very true. And, I think sometimes if we say, well, how would, you, how would you dress if the President of the United States was going to meet with you this morning? How would you, what would you wear? I mean, you, know, you might not put on a three-piece suit or a tuxedo or something, but you'd, you'd at least maybe, you know, if you're a male, you'd put on a button-down shirt and tuck it in, and if you're a female, you'd wear something uh, business casual appropriate, you know, and I think that that's, look, we don't need to be unnaturally formal, unnaturally reverent, but just within the culture. How do we show respect? And we want that same thing when we're coming to the presence, as you said, of the capital J judge. Yeah. Please. I also think of the churches in Europe. I mean, it's not just American Christianity. There are these beautiful churches that were mm. built to the glory of God are empty. There's nothing yes, there. I know. It's so I sad. Know. You know, it always reminds me. Remember when Jesus says, if, if these weren't crying out, the stones would. And I think, I sometimes think of that when I think of the old churches and the heritage that's left behind. Quite literally, the stones are crying out 
to all who have eyes to see, ears to hear, um, and they're telling the tale that the people have long forgotten, the, the tale of God's grace and mercy. And I don't, I, in context, I don't think that that's what Jesus meant, but I think it's nonetheless kind of a, an interesting application of his word that where people don't no longer cry out in praise and thanksgiving for who he is and what he's done for us and what lies ahead of us all because of his grace and goodness than the stones do. That's, that's, and I think that that's encouragement for us, by the way. Um, one, of the, one of the things I'm so proud about our, our church and our sanctuary is the, is the crucifix we have front and center, the processional cross. You know, our services begin. Where are our eyes? On Jesus. The pastor's eyes, everyone. Everyone's eyes are on Jesus. That's how it begins. How does it end? Same way. Everybody's eyes on Jesus, Christ the crucified. During the services, our attention is up front. You can't miss it. Front and center, the crucifix. Eyes, hearts, minds on Jesus. All around our sanctuary, stained glass that tell the story of the, the life of Jesus and all the things that he's done. Everything is Jesus. It's so wonderful because if even if I, even if I, um, and God help me from ever doing this, even if I forgot to preach Jesus one Sunday, well, first of all, you all would tell me, and second of all, it would clash terribly with the environs. And the whole, and, and the whole sanctuary itself would be preaching Jesus to you. A, a similar strength in the liturgy. You know, why do you have a liturgy? Well, because if you've ever paid attention to the liturgy, it's just chocked full of the Word of God. I mean, basically every line is the Word of God or comes from the Word of God. So that even if the pastor dropped the ball and forgot to preach the law and the gospel, forgot to tell you about Jesus, guess what? The entire liturgy does. And so too, the liturgy, okay, think about it this way. All right. The whole sanctuary is preaching Christ. The whole liturgy is preaching Christ. If the pastor doesn't, he's going to stand out like a sore thumb, isn't he? That's why we have that stuff. Now think about this. Why would a pastor want to remove the liturgy? Why would a pastor want to empty the church? Why would the pastor want to take away the things of Christ? Why does he feel uncomfortable in their presence? Because he's not preaching Christ. Because he's not preaching Christ. Now these things are symptomatic. We don't want to. We don't want to start saying that these things come out of the Word of God and their laws, and you must have X and you must have Y and you must do X. No, 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 no. That's not what we're saying. You're free in Christ to do whatever you want. But what do you want? And why is it that that in churches where Christ has disappeared? from the preaching, Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, the sacraments of Christ. Why is it that in those places where the pastor doesn't preach that, so also the liturgy that's all about Christ, the church here that's all about Christ, the lectionary that's all about Christ, the furniture, the altar, baptismal font, pulpit that's all about Christ, the crucifix, the very architecture and structure of the church, the stained glass windows that tell about Christ. Why is it that all of these things have disappeared too? Because they're all part of the same. They're all symptomatic of the root problem. You see? So, where Christ is being preached, all these other things naturally flow out and are there. And they're there not only as a blessing and a fruit of the preaching of Christ and of the people's faith in Christ, but then they also stand firm as a testament when God's done with me, when uh, here at Faith, <laughs> when God calls me away, or m even better for me, calls me to heaven, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be the greatest divine call of all. And, and another pastor comes in here, I want it to be unthinkable that he wouldn't preach Christ. Unthinkable. I want him to clash immediately with, if he's not going to preach Christ, he's going to clash immediately with the liturgy. He's going to clash immediately with the furniture and with the sanctuary. He's going to clash immediately with your expectations. And you all are going to pull him aside and say, Pastor, we need you to preach Jesus or we need to find a pastor who will. Right? 
And so all of these things form, form kind of safeguards then too and are the testimony of who we are to the next generations, to our children and to the next pastor and, and our expectations of him. So all of these things are organic and flow together. And that's really what I'm trying to say. So when we, sometimes we, we talk about worship wars or we you know, nitpick, um, you know, or maybe it seems like we're nitpicking, you know, these stylistic things. They're not. They're all of a piece. In fact, there's this ancient phrase that's been passed down to us that, that is really kind of the shorthand for the fact that all of these things are organically connected. Lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of faith. What does that mean? Um, lex orandi, the law of prayer. That is how it is you worship is determined by and reflective of what it is that you credendi, believe. So this works both ways. How you believe is how you worship. If Christ is at the center, then that's going to be evident in your worship and in all the forms surrounding it. Likewise, if, or maybe flip, it, flip the coin, in a church where you don't have any of the Orandi, where Christ isn't there present visibly in the liturgy, in the furniture, in, the, in, in all, all the sort of symptomatic types of things, okay, what is that going to do? That's going to pass on to the next generation a credendi, a belief, a faith, and that faith is not going to be Christ-centered, you see? So it, it cuts both ways. What you believe is how you will worship, and by the way, how you worship is what the next generation will believe. Why is there, a, why is there mass apostasy and mass falling away in the younger generations from the church? Well, because one generation said, hey, we believe all these things about Jesus, but worship, form, style, it doesn't matter. Get rid of it all. So we have Lex Credendi. We don't need Lex Arandi. But what does the next generation learn from the Lex Arandi that we don't need the Lex Credendi either? You see how that works? And so now we've got, hey, we're all about Jesus. Let's just take all the stuff about Jesus away. The next generation comes in and says, hey, there's nothing here about Jesus. I don't need Jesus at all. And that's why Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi always have to be held together in symmetry. I mean, the church fathers have recognized this for centuries upon centuries, and we Lutherans are, are no different in championing this. We're just in an alien land and an alien culture championing this, saying, hey, all of this stuff goes together. It's an organic whole, and if you lose one, you're going to lose the other, even if only on a generational way. All right, sorry for that long diatribe, but please. Well, now two things come up. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, when you say it's, um, I'll just say, in the ancient church, there were many unschooled people, illiterate people, and the way they learned about the story of Christ was through the icons and the stained glass windows and the stations of the cross, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important. Um, the other thing I was saying, I was trying to say when you were um, saying we don't dress for church, you know, a lot of us don't. Um, I'm thinking, well, where's the only place that everybody dresses up? Mm -hmm. Weddings. Weddings. Uh -huh. And it can be in a hall and they dress up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it's, it's almost become pagan in my view. <laughs> <laughs> so... It I just, will say that by and large, I mean, I, that was, this was no commentary on faith, Capo. I, no, by and I large, I that. see our people doing this. I see our people but not in other places. dressing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, and I don't, again, I don't mean in an overly formal or kind of weird way. I just mean they're wearing what you would wear in our culture if it was an important thing. Not uh, what you wore to clean the house. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. not your pajamas, not your, yeah. not your beach gear. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Thank you. All good? All right. Thanks for your comments and, and um, thanks for the engagement. Another comment here, Pastor. Please. Uh, you know, in the beginning, the believers were known as um, professing the way. I think the Bible says that. They mm -hmm. were called the way. Mm -hmm. And then in the church in Antioch, they became known as Christians. Yeah. And not to defend, but I'd like your comment on... Um, 
you know, when I was growing up, you know, you would have a friend say, are you a Christian? Mm -hmm. That's where the you center became, okay, I am a Christian. And um, I think that's where maybe some of the I, I centered things began. Mm -hmm. I am a Christian. Okay, instead of I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a disciple of Christ. I mean, I, you, you get that kind of mixed up yeah. in your brain, and then you, it's all about you. It starts to become about you. Mm -hmm. What work have I done or whatever? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a natural humanistic uh, way, but right. uh, I guess maybe the term Christian, uh, maybe there, how would you answer someone right now if, if they said you, you could kind of I guess how would you take the focus off of my identity mm. and put it back to Christ when you're dealing with the third person mm. you know it's a great question and I I, th I think maybe in in some respects it's the content of this chapter and the content of this class I mean that's the fullest answer let me shoot off on just a tangent, since we're talking about American Christianity, and, and maybe this will, uh, will help give a, a kind of biblical balance to, to the question. So, um, here in uh, Southern California, if you want to listen to religious programming, uh, there, are, there are two different uh, radio stations you can listen to where you can get that pretty much 24-7. Um, well, maybe not exactly that. I do think the Roman Catholic one has off hours. But anyway, you can get it regularly. So 1000 AM is the Roman Catholic one. I haven't listened to this for some time. And then I can't recall the, the exact FM channel. It's 1000 AM and the FM channel is kind of the Calvary Chapel out here, that, that kind of take. Do you know what it is off the top of your head? 106.3 or yeah. is that right? 106.9, okay, we've got, all right. So you can listen, you can listen to Roman Catholic sermons and you can listen to um, evangelical sermons here. And, um, and, and so I was doing this for a while. And one of the things that I found really interesting is um, the Roman Catholics would not talk about um, converting to Christ nearly as much as they would talk about converting to the church. So you're becoming not so much a Christian, but a Roman Catholic. You're becoming the family of which, you know, and I don't want to disparage this. It's not as if Christ is absent, okay? It's just where's the emphasis? The emphasis is on the church, conversion to the church. And I started thinking to myself, well, that's unnatural. Shouldn't it be conversion to Christ? About that same time, I was kind of listening to the evangelicals. And guess, guess the way the evangelicals teach? Conversion to Christ. And they never mention conversion to the church. Now, of course, they want you to attend, but it's just conversion to Christ. And it dawned on me that that was just the opposite error. Because what are you going to do? convert to Christ in your car? Okay, I've converted to Christ. Now what am I going to do? Continue listening to the radio station in my car. Well, that's not, that's not Christianity either. It dawned on me that what we have here in America are two aberrations. The emphasis on the one is convert to Christ, not so much the church. And the other is convert to the church, hopefully also to Christ. You see, the emphasis is on the wrong syllable in both. They're two opposite errors. They're two op so what do we need to do? Well, we wed the two together. And that's exactly what we find in the scriptures. It is, conversion to Christ is conversion to the church, and conversion to the church is conversion to Christ. You can't be one without the other. Maybe the most fundamental way that this, that this uh, should be taught is the Lord's Prayer is not yours to pray until you're baptized. When you are baptized, you have one baptism, one faith, one Lord, one Father, our Father. So there is no such thing as I convert to Christ apart from the family. There is no prayer, my Father who art in heaven. This kind of individualized Christianity is the emphasis on the wrong syllable almost to the point of being wrong. Okay? 
But then this idea of like, well, I'm going to convert to the church and join this group, and it's all about community, and it's all about relationships, and it's all about that. That's just the opposite error, isn't it? When I convert to Christ, I convert to his church. It's never me and Jesus. It's always the church in Jesus, of which I am now a part. I am baptized into Christ, baptized into this church. I'm not going to heaven without my brothers and sisters. They're not going to heaven without me. I'm not going to communion without my brothers and sisters. There is no me and Jesus communion. There is no me and Jesus baptism. There is no me and Jesus Christianity. Um, it's an aberration. We're deluding ourselves. And many, many, I mean, this is also a disease then. Many, many Christian people in the country believe themselves to be Christians, but never go to church. Believe themselves to be Christians, but never, but, but, and, and maybe go to communion, but, but go to communion thinking it's just me and Jesus. So, Barry, I know it's a long-winded answer, but since we're talking about American Christianity, I think this gives you a kind of a lay of the land and the aberrations taking place in our midst and how a, a faithful, biblical, and historical Christianity calls us back to a holistic, holistic understanding. In converting to Christ, I convert to the church. In being baptized into Christ, I am baptized into a family of believers. I can never pray, my Father who art in heaven, I must always pray, our Father who art in heaven. And realizing the corporate nature and essence. I, I'm going to stop here, but by the way, this just goes even deeper. I could probably talk another 45 minutes on how this changes our theology and our anthropology, our understanding of God and our understanding of ourselves. Because um, in, in, our, in these gray and latter days, our entire perception of God and ourselves as human beings has completely distorted and twisted. We no longer even understand who we are as, as man. We no longer understand that man is in and of himself a corporate conglomerate being. There is no such thing as an individual. And I could wax on that, like I said, for a long time. We see the same thing reflected in God, by the way. That God as Trinity, it, his oneness consists precisely in the plurality, in the family of God. Again, oneness and plurality, one in three persons. So those two concepts reflect each other, and the loss on one side of the coin is tantamount to a loss on the other side of the coin. So as we view, I'm converting to not only Christ, but his church, not only the church, but most certainly Christ. And I'm not ever converted alone. I'm not ever alone in this. That has, that has a way of healing our anthropology and our theology in massive ways, massive ways. Please. Oh, I love everything you've been saying. And what's been changing in my life, where I used to say I am a Christian, now I say I'm a child of God. I've been baptized into Christ. Ah. Now, should we be adding something onto that, like, and I worship with other children of God every Sunday? Anything? <laughs> Do you think anything needs to be added to that? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think it's a wonderful answer. I think it's a sufficient answer. Um, followers of Christ, followers of the way, um, that, that has a kind of plurality to it, um, inherent. Child of God does too. If it, again, if all of these things are properly understood, the problem in our culture is there. They're not properly understood. So a follow, you know, I'm a follower of Christ. It's kind of like, again, in our culture, is already laden with that individuality. Um, you got to fight through that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you were speaking specifically to this issue, maybe you'd say, I'm a member of the family of God. You know, or I'm, uh, or I'm uh, you know, so something that really emphasizes the plurality. Am I saying that you have to describe yourself? As, no, by no means. I do whatever you see fit. But, but kind of, you know, how might you conceive of this in a way that it communicates it to others? Um, your identity within the corporate body of the, of the church of God. Yeah. Great, great question. Great thoughts. And like you said, this is as all in one as Christ is head and his body. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I, this corporateness is really the essence of Holy Communion. Because in receiving his body, we become his body. In receiving his blood, his life is our life. And I can't be part of his body without 
you because you're all part of his body and I can't his, have his life without you also being my life because his life is your life, his life is mine. It's all one life, it's all one life, it's all one body. Holy Communion teaches this more than anything else. You can see how sadly our, our biblical understanding of communion has atrophied in these, in these latter days. So what are we doing? We're returning to the source of God's Word, which can change and reform and enliven us and enliven others uh, and restore to us the centrality of Holy Communion. Um, the centrality. Yeah, by the way, um, just as a tangent, in the, in the Western liturgy, the liturgy of the Western Church, you see two services. You see the service of the Word and the service of the sacrament. That's our language, but you know you can call it whatever you want. But you see these kind of two different services pushed together in our liturgy. Um, you can even tell that by the headings. In between the two is like offering, and if there's any announcements, it's kind of this casual moment in the service because you, the, you're recognizing that there's these two different services and we're in between the two. Where did the service of the Word come from? Well, that came right out of the Hebrew liturgies of the first century and much earlier. Their whole, what was it like when you went to synagogue? It was a service of the word. We even see our Lord Jesus preaching in the synagogue, preaching from the scroll of Isaiah. That was the high point of that service of the word, of that liturgy. So what does the early church do as they're coming out of the Hebrew faith? They retain the service of the word, and what do they add on? The service of the sacrament because Jesus says do this as often as you can and it's recognized that this is now the New Testament the heart of everything and so you can see then historically how in continuity we retain the service of the word and then because it is the New Testament Christ gives the service of the sacrament comes along and so word and sacrament that forming the divine service forming the essence of the Christian liturgy this has been around forever this has been around from the time of Christ up to the very present Okay. Obviously, some of the details have changed and can change, but that, that liturgical structure, this is why some people say liturgy properly understood. Liturgy is not adiaphora. It's not indifferent. You can't change it willy-nilly um, because the church has universally held in continuity with the Old Testament people of God the service of the word and then the new covenant, the service of the sacraments. So all these things are, are tied together and are given to us. All of this individualism also then equates to a cutting ourselves off from the history of the church. Much of American Christianity today, especially the kind of the evangelical, it's like us and the apostles. What happened in between? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it's us and the apostles. Or, or maybe it's us and this reformer, or that reformer, and then the apostles. Those are the, the three points. Now that's, pretty, that's pretty weak. That's pretty weak. What we want to do is see how the, the apostolic worship, the worship of the first century church, connects with the worship of ancient Israel grabs many of its elements and weds them in and then celebrates as the climax of that the new covenant, the New Testament in Christ's cup, all right? And then that moves forward as an unchangeable liturgy through time and space up to the very present. So we see ourselves in continuity as Lutherans, not, not in continuity merely with today, Luther, the apostles, Oh, that would be a sham Lutheranism. That would be a sham church. We see ourselves in continuity with all Christians of all times and all places. And that continuity centers in terms of the simple liturgy of the word and sacrament every Sunday. And then we find ourselves in doctrinal unity with them. So what I'm doing here is, is giving you another distinction, sometimes articulated this way, primary theology and secondary theology. Primary theology is what you actually do on Sunday morning. Because everything else is secondary to that. Everything else informs that. But that's what it actually is. Christianity isn't me sitting in my study preparing for Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning. 
<laughs> you're not second-class citizens because you go to church and the real, the real theology is what happens in the pastor's brain or in the pastor with his book. No, that's secondary. Primary theology is what we all do on Sunday morning. Secondary theology is the formal study of this, articulation of this, dealing with errors so that they don't encroach upon the primary theology. In terms of primary theology, I've expressed our unity with the historic church in the service of the word and sacrament, how we retain that to this very day. In terms of secondary theology, um, theology that you might, your brain might immediately go to an academic sense, which isn't quite right, but if it gets you there, it gets you there. Everything that doesn't happen on a Sunday morning. Okay? That's secondary theology you might think of as the Book of Concord. Okay? So, and the Book of Concord, how does that work? Well, here's what God's Word says. Here's what church fathers A, B, C, D, E, F, and G say. And here's what we say. And so Lutherans were interested, again, not in a, not in a, histori- not in a continuity of like us, Luther, the apostles. Oh, no, no, no. The book that defines what Lutheran is says the apostles, all the faithful church fathers, Luther and the Luther reformers, and then us because we subscribe to it. So as you have primary and secondary theology, then you have us in continuity with those and with the entire Christian church for 2,000 years in our liturgy and in our teaching. Now what's the point of this? When we're talking about individuality and this kind of disease that's come in where it's all me as Christian or it's me and Jesus and we've lost this corporate thing, guess what we've also lost? A sense of our corporate homogeny with all of history and the historic church. Okay, so the point is, not only have we lost a corporate sense present tense with the living church of Christ, but we've also lost a corporate sense stretching back historically. All that to say, the churches that tend to focus on the, on the Christian rather than Christ, not only, not only reveal an individualism present tense, but reveal that individualism in their understanding of the liturgy and in the formal doctrines of the church. Their touchstones will be now and the apostles, now the Reformation and the apostles. They won't have continuity. Their touchstone with the liturgy will be like, eh, we, now, yeah, we keep a couple hymns for the old people, and that's about it. Um, so, you can, so what I'm trying to say is where, the in, where Christ is ta- has been taken away, where the Christian reigns, the disease is not just present tense. The disease stretches all the way back into our understanding of the liturgy. That's why it's just the church of what's happening now instead of a historic liturgy that connects us with the Christians of all times and places. And where the theology is just sort of like, well, let's never touch on anything we might disagree on. Let's all just agree to get along. And the way we do that is pretty much just 10 steps to a better you. And that becomes then our preaching and our formal theology becomes, uh, yeah, the word of God's not clear on all these other things, so let's just all agree to agree and the church will get bigger. Okay, you can see how that's utterly disconnected from the historic church. So, so I, you know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't apologize for the digression here because I think it's an important one. It's just, it's a, another huge facet and dimension that we have lost as the Christian church in America because we failed to have Christ and his church front and center. Um, and instead it's all become about me, the Christian. We've, we've lost present tense, we've lost past tense. And so that's really what I'm trying to articulate here. All right, any, uh, any thoughts you have, questions, comments, adjustments you want to make to what I was saying? Um, sure, Alice has a, a question or comment here. How do you relate to people, you know, I think of our extended family, mm-hmm. who doesn't have this, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And when we talk about Christ, they say, well, you think I'm not a Christian? Oh, of course, you know, you're a follower of Christ, okay, right. you know, I get that. But they think, uh, in fact, we've been told that we're too legalistic. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? I mean, they're our family, for goodness sakes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Un, I, well, it's a whole other discourse. Yeah, but... But in America, America is, is Gnostic. America is therefore iconoclastic. It's all up here in my head and in here in my heart and me and Jesus. And so it's, that's the Gnostic aspect. And how does this affect my person or behavior or what I do? It doesn't. Um, and, and so there's this kind of, and then because it's all in my head and my heart and it's not physically expressed, um, form becomes law. And so a church that has form, um, things that aren't happening in my head and in my heart, like a crucifix, like yeah, yeah. stained glass, like liturgy, like form becomes misunderstood as legalism. Okay. I mean, what if, what if you said, so you've got such great piety in your heart and in your mind, so you would kneel at the communion rail when you take communion, right? No, I would never do that. That's legalistic. Wait, it's legalistic to bend your body in the way that your heart and mind are? It's legalistic to bend your order of service to a liturgy, to a form? You know, it's legalistic to bend your church structure to fit Christ? So you see how the form, I mean, again, this is a much bigger dialogue we can have, but that's why we get charged with legalism. You have to realize it's not a valid claim form is being misperceived as legalism by those who have embraced an American Gnosticism. In, in Russia, when they had no Bibles, right. when they were all taken away, people remembered the liturgy and sang it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. I mean, what we're, what we're doing and taking away, what do my kids hear when they go to church? What do they experience when they go to church? Well, I make sure they at least hear part of the sermon because I frequently ask them about it. Okay. Or as my daughter sometimes laments, in our family devotions, I'll actually be piecing together my sermon, and then she'll hear that on Sunday, and she'll, a Sunday afternoon, she'll be like, Dad, we already heard that. <laughs> yeah, because she had it in the week prior. Ah, what are our children getting, though? They come into church, and they're, they're taking in the full sensory experience. They're looking at the stained glass. They're, they're absorbing all this. The, the liturgy, the structure, they're, they're absorbing it all. When you take that all away, what are they absorbing? You know, there's, there's this kind of truism. It's not always the case by God's grace, but there's this kind of truism that whatever your church is doing now, the next generation is going to take it one step less. Whatever your family devotions are now, your children are going to take it one step less. And this is, this is to me like really the terrifying and unnerving thing when families are like, yeah, we go to church once a month. I can just about predict to you that your children aren't going to go to church. It's just like a statistical fact. I'm not being mean. It's just what's going to happen. Um, so there's this, there's this great thing we lose when we strip all these things away. And this is the Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi point. Because our children are absorbing all of this. They're absorbing the corporate nature. They're absorbing the teachings of the structure, the teachings of the liturgy. They're absor they absorb through form. That's why when you go to a school classroom, an elementary classroom, where's Ellie when we need her? Um, they all fit a certain form, don't they? You don't walk into a classroom and it's like an auditorium with nothing there. You walk into a classroom, it's got, here's the desks, here's the art, here's the stations, here's the alphabet around the top. It's got a form to it, right? Every time we do, we do actual learning like for our children, it always has form. So to take away that form, because we all know better, is to destroy the faith of the next generation. Yeah. Well, my friends, we are over time. I apologize for that. Let's, let's pause there. We've hit many topics today, and that's good, because this chapter is all about um, our focus on Christ and how American Christianity has wittingly and unwittingly taken our focus away. And in taking our focus away, we're experiencing all the things we're experiencing and that we think are normal, and they're not. The Lord be with you.